Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Activism and Advocacy in Athletics, Building on the Legacy of MLK. This is a partnership between uh, UCLA Athletics Department and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So we want to have, first and foremost, a huge thanks to Director of Athletics, Martin Jarman, uh, as well as Vice Chancellor uh, for EDI, Anna Spain Bradley, for their support and sort of continued leadership uh, through the planning of these uh, of this this wonderful event, um, big special thanks to Associate Athletic Director Dr. Kenny Donaldson uh, and Dr. Tyrone Howard uh, for their tireless efforts leading UCLA athletics equity and diversity diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, we really can't thank them enough for the work that they do on campus. Um, with that. Let's start things off with a few words from Dr. Howard, who regrets that he could not be here in person tonight. So here's Dr. Howard. Hello and welcome. I would like to welcome you to the MLK Advocacy and Activism and Athletics panel here at UCLA. It's my honor and privilege to be here with you today. My name is Professor Tyrone Howard. I am in the School of Education and Information Studies here at UCLA. I cannot think of more important time for us to be able to come together to talk about important issues of the day uh, during this week of recognizing and celebrating uh, the life's work and the commitment and sacrifices of Dr. Martin Luther King. But I think it's important for us to talk about the ways in which advocacy and activism uh, has been uh, such a part of the fabric of life at UCLA. And in so many ways, Dr. King's work and Dr. King's words have inspired countless people the world over. And UCLA has been one of the places where his work and his words have manifested itself in a number of changes over the last several decades on our campus with regard to equity, inclusion, the recognition of opportunity for groups of people who have historically been overlooked and underserved. Uh, we have made tremendous progress, but let us be clear that that work is not done and we still have a long way to go. And today's panel is about the ways in which we can be more involved and more active and more justice oriented to make sure that we uphold the principles of the work and life of Dr. King. Not only has UCLA been a place where activism and act advocacy has been a core staple of what we do, but I think more importantly, when you think about the athletic domain here at UCLA, there's been another place where we've seen advocacy and activism uplifted. When you think about individuals such as Jackie Robinson, you think about individuals such as Arthur Ashe, individuals such as Lou Alcindor and even Rayford Johnson, these were pioneers who were willing to lead and fight for justice and recognition and equity at a time when others did not want to hear those calls and thought that those calls were not warranted. Uh, those individuals and countless others who have been UCLA student athletes have really been the, the forebears of helping us to recognize that they are more than just athletes. And I must say that those commitments that those prior student athletes here at UCLA have been invested in has made it possible for today's student athletes to use their voices and to use their platforms to begin to raise issues around change and issues around inclusion and to fight against all forms of hate. I have been really honored to see the number of UCLA student athletes who have used social media, who have used their various voices in a number of ways to say, we want to see a, a much more inclusive UCLA. We wanna see a more inclusive Los Angeles. We wanna see a better world. And I think we live in a moment and a time where we cannot say, we want you just to be student athletes. Use your voice. Uh, use your intellect, use your ideas and your insights to help cre create the world that we want to be. So this is why this panel is so important today, because we get to hear from some of our student athletes who are more than just athletes. Uh, we get to hear from student athletes who are thinking about change, but more importantly, they're being the change that they would like to see. And in so many ways, when you think about the demands that are placed on these individuals as not only just full-time students, given the academic demands and rigor of a place like UCLA, but also being full-time athletes as well and the demands and the rigors that are required with that. So these are individuals who are excelling uh, in the classroom as well as in their respective sports. And so that's why their voices in terms of activism is even more important because they are saying that I will be seen. They are saying that I will be heard and I will fight for those issues that I stand for, whether it be issues of racism that need to be eradicated, issues of sexism which need to be destroyed, if it's issues tied to homophobia, transphobia, issues tied to nativism, uh, any form of discrimination that we know is in place, we need to all play a role to speak up and stand out and make sure that those things do not become core to who we are as a campus community. 
I'm also excited and honored to be a part of this work because for the last year, I've been fortunate to work as a special advisor to Athletic Director Martin Jarman around issues tied to equity, justice, and inclusion. Uh, this work is important because it's not about just having titles, it's about being involved in the work and listening to student athletes and working with, with coaches and, and staff members and recognizing how our student athletes need to make sure that they are heard and seen in some really robust ways and that we are being as fair and as equitable as we can be as an institution. I'm also honored to be able to work with my good friend, uh, Associate Athletic Director Kenny Donaldson. He has been really at the forefront of this work for the last several years, and I'm honored to to be able to know Kenny, consider him a friend and a colleague, and know that he is someone who is fighting the good fight, who is raising issues of awareness, making sure that we don't make these issues superficial, but that we're really willing to grapple with hard, difficult, complex issues on a day in, day out basis, not only in our respective classrooms, not only on our playing fields, uh, but on our larger campus communities, but also across the city of Los Angeles, the state of California, the entire nation, and for that matter, across the globe. So I think that at this point in time, it's the time for us to listen and learn from our student athletes. But as you listen to them, I ask you to listen to them with the thought in mind. What is my role? What can I do? How can I be better? And each and every one of us can be better. Each and every one of us can play a role. And I think as we think about the ways in which we continue to think about advocacy and activism, it doesn't have to be major acts. It's the small acts, the acts of kindness, the acts of service, the acts of giving, the acts of dedication, sacrifice, mentorship uh, are all ways in which we can make our mark. So everyone here today, I ask that we be reflective, that we be thoughtful, that we be mindful of how can we uphold the legacy that is Dr. King's work? How can we within our respective sphere of influence ensure that we are not letting that dream die because we are not willing to play our role? We are benefactors of Dr. King's work. We are benefactors of Dr. King's dream, but let us not take that for granted. Let us not have his work be in vain, let us use our time, our talents, and our resources to make sure that we are doing everything within our power to do this work and do it well, do it well for the betterment of those who will come after us. So again, welcome. Uh, we're glad you're here. We're looking forward to a really robust, rich conversation. And please, let's be part of the change that we would all like to see. Thank you so much. So good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Kenny Donaldson. I'm an Associate Athletic Director and Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here in uh, UCLA Athletics. Um, before we, we start the program with you know, that great intro from Dr. Howard, I did want to recognize this past weekend uh, what is going on in Tonga, Samoa, and other affected areas, and wanted to send our hopes and our prayers and well wishes out to those communities that have been affected by what's going on with the uh, weather situation, the tsunamis in those areas. So I did wanna recognize that. I also wanted to give thanks, and I know the uh, Jonathan spoke for the EDI office, but I wanted to give thanks back from the Department of Athletics to the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and the folks involved in this from uh, Anna to Jonathan to Anissa and Rusty. They've been great partners in this and we'll continue this partnership, You know, not just for this year, but throughout the upcoming years as well. So be prepared and stay tuned for that. As I prepared for this panel and I thought about this weekend of especially yesterday, the, the messages on Twitter, Instagram, social media, you know, regarding the legacy and uplifting Dr. Martin Luther King, I thought about, you know, the world that he lived in where there wasn't social media to get a message out and the ability he had to uplift and upraise advocacy and activism without having social media, without getting messages out across the world and the advantage that a lot of our student athletes and coaches and administrators who we'll talk to have with social media, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and things of that nature. So it just made me think that the work that he did is so powerful and impactful that a lot of people wonder, well, how can Dr. Martin Luther King be compared or have a legacy in athletics? And one of the arguments I would use is that student athletes and athletes across the world are some of the most visible, most followed people on social media. So as Dr. Howard mentioned, the fact that not just on social media are we seeing student athletes uplift and use their voice in advocacy, but we'll talk to some student athletes and alum as well who are taking this action and putting it into plan. So creating social change through their actions and gathering others to, uh, to help build this community that we want to create uh, justice and belonging for everyone. So again, I want to thank those that are part of this panel and the foundation of this really exists with our coaches and administrators. It's great to have the student athletes uh, use their voice, but without coaches and administrators supporting them 
and uh, being behind them, I think a lot of this might not be able to uh, happen without this environment that we're creating. So I want to introduce our coaches and administrators that are going to be part of this panel. First, our director of track and field at UCLA, Coach Avery Anderson. Uh, our women's basketball assistant coach, Tasha Brown. Our uh, football assistant coach, Brian Norwood. And our director of student athlete development, Rick Coy. Great. So uh, as we start this panel, you know, when I was doing research and just thinking about some of the things in athletics that have happened even before uh, the murder of George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, I know those events really hit our student athletes hard, but it hit our community hard as well. And I know Coach Anderson, to start out with you, you penned a very poignant letter last year that publicly was placed on the UCLA website that, you know, I know you wrote from the heart about how the killing of George Floyd, how hard it hit you and what it meant to you. And you reflected on, uh, you know, thinking back to, to Rodney King and how that incident affected you. And I want to take a direct quote from the letter that you wrote where you said, I found it easier to unshackle myself from hate and walk forward with love. So if you wouldn't mind, can you talk to us about kind of where that letter came from and, and what you were feeling when you wrote that letter? Uh, yeah, thank you um, everyone uh, for putting this on. This is great, um, honored to be here and share with you guys. Uh, so for myself, yeah, it, it took me back to uh, my freshman year. Um, you know, things were a little similar, you know, had some similarities from the standpoint of um, there was a backlash and uprising um, that was occurring because of an incident that happened with police officers when I was in school. And, you know, um, a lot of that's, that was a lot of time ago, but, you know, we found ourselves in a similar situation, you know, with society, um, you know, really, um, at least visibly being able to, to, for the first time, I think with George Floyd, be able to, or sorry, with uh, Rodney King, be able to see, um, you know, that and it gain attention, you know, on television. And then, you know, fast forward to today's age where, you know, we have what we didn't have then, you know, not only the internet, but social media and, you know, camera phones and things like that. So I felt like the, um, you know, just, just getting that visibly uh, shown and, and for people who had never seen that kind of abuse um, to be able to, to see that firsthand, there's a lot of different emotion. And, you know, for myself, I have a team that's very diverse, you know, we're a hundred plus um, from all walks of life. And including both men and women, you know, combined in the program. So there was a lot of emotion and feelings and thoughts that occurred within my specific team. And, you know, I knew that for me, when Rodney King happened, uh, what it was like to be on a, another team, a football team uh, here at UCLA, as well as a track team with both being, you know, similar size and what we went through as a team and the conversations we, we had. And as a young person, 18, 19, 20 years old, um, what George Floyd sparked was a lot of rage and anger and, um, you know, people, young people might um, feel a certain way that I had insight to. And I thought it would be, um, you know, best for my team, as Dr. Howard said, um, you know, we're, we're leading our young students and mentoring them. What would be the best way for me to serve my students at this point in time? And so the experience that I had with that for myself personally, and also, you know, the teammates that I had that, you know, we sat down and had conversations in depth about, you know, race and police brutality and things that some hadn't ever seen, may not have believed it without seeing the video. Uh, it just kind of rehashed itself in the George Floyd incident. And so 30 years later, as the leader of a program, you know, as I said, with 100 plus students, um, I felt like, you know, I, I had to um, share what I know, what I felt, because it's at this moment that you can let the hate and the rage and the anger um, lead you in the wrong direction. And so for me, it was a matter of trying to share some insight to lead students in the right direction in a, in a more, um, in a direction that's fueled more by love as Dr. King, you know, was one of his major tenets was leading with love. And even in times where it's hard to do so, um, you know, I didn't want to see uh, any of my students get derailed by that anger and let that build up into something that could fester and become worse for them. And so, you know, initially that letter was private with just my team um, and shared just in our program. And, you know, at um, request, I thought it would be 
uh, a good thing for others to hear that. Um, and just having had the experience, wanted to share, um, you know, in any little bit that it might uh, serve to help others. So that's kind of where that came from. And it was not easy to write. It was difficult. It was difficult to, you know, summon love in a time where, you know, I I've been watching this a long time. You know, um, I'm a lot, I'm, I'm old. So I've been seeing this in my neighborhood. I've been seeing it um, just personally. I've experienced some of it. And so just knowing that it, it can um, it can build up to something that uh, can cost people, you know, jobs and spots on teams and things with the wrong action, um, trying to feel, a, you know, trying to figure out a way to help the students feel um, a, something a little bit deeper than just the easy emotion of, of you know, rage and anger. And so that's, that's essentially where it came from. And, um, you know, I, I think that it did, in hindsight, help, you know, lots of students. So I'm happy about that. Thanks, Coach, for, for sharing that with us. And, you know, as we talk about uh, having these conversations with teams and then moving towards action, you know, uh, Coach Brown, I want to talk about, you know, women's basketball has been at the forefront with uh, the More Than a Dream uh, program about having these conversations, which may be difficult at times, and creating action. So can you speak to our, our group and our audience about More Than a Dream and talk about some of the conversations that you and the young women on the team were having? Sure. Thank you, Kenny. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on in the athletic department as well as the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Um, I think this is awesome. Um, more than a dream um, was born during the time of the George Floyd murder. Um, and to me, I think the, the, the impact of George Floyd's murder was that it came during the time where we were locked down um, in quarantine because of COVID. And I think the thing that made it so impactful was social media and his death really spread through every household. I mean, there were murders of African-American men and women before George Floyd, but the fact that we were at home and it was the only thing that you could watch. And so it seeped into the social media and the TikTok and the Instagram and the Twitter of not only black households, but white households. And I think the thing that made so many people of all colors come together was the fact that, okay, now you got to explain, you know, why your 10 year old kid um, saw this man killed live on social media. And so obviously, you know, as a, as a black woman, I was enraged and our players, um, our, especially our African-American kids um, had a lot of emotion to that uh, as, as, as a lot of people in America did. And so, the conversations spawned from that. And it was about similar to what Coach Avery is talking about. What do you do with those emotions? Um, and we spent a lot of time, you know, unpacking that. And do we just want to be mad? Do we just want to shoot off and tweet and, and do the things that, you know, everybody else is, is going to do? And uh, we decided that we wanted to do something more. We wanted to do something impactful. Um, we wanted to um, do something that transcended us and really provoke change. And so uh, we have some very powerful uh, women on our team, passionate women, um, and, and they're, they're standing up for justice and they're standing up for um, what's right. And so, you know, us as a coaching staff, and it really, it really is, you know, spearheaded by our leader, Coach Corey, who uh, is a white female. And she's like, hey, help me, help me understand, help me see my blind spots and how can I help empower our young women to use their platforms, um, to use their voices and, and to really help them manifest the things that they wanna do. So it started with her and then Coach Shannon and I came alongside of them to say, hey, if we're really gonna do something, then let's do it right. And so we really helped them develop a mission statement um, and, and really lay out what they wanted to do. And so the mission came down to striving to be at the cornerstone um, as we advance towards a world that embodies true equality committed to sculpting a new culture in which everyone feels safe, seen, and heard, regardless of race, identity, or background. And so that was the mission statement. And the more than a dream um, really hinged and, and was is closely related to uh, Martin Luther King. But we wanted to say more than a dream because we got to put some feet to you know what he was saying, put some hands and feet to this. And so um, you know, we, we started talking about what we wanted to do. And so the acronym um, DREAM, it, it was, it stands for diversity in all spaces. 
all cultures, socioeconomic status, backgrounds, and preferences. The R is reveal, and that's very true, and basically the history and the joys of our community. Um, the E is for educate and bring awareness to systematic uh, racism, whether it's voting and, or schooling or microaggressions, all of those different things. Advocate, give a voice to the voiceless. They, they understand that they have a very powerful platform uh, and they really wanted to use that. Uh, and then to motivate people to speak out and to use their platforms and to use the places that they're in uh, to really give a voice and, and highlight these things. And so I'm very proud of our young women. Um, the fact that, you know, I've watched them grow through this and very proud of the fact that they've stood behind that. And, and like Coach Avery, we, before they got, you know, to talking on their social media, we said, hey, you're going to get some pushback. You're going to have some people that don't like this. And you're going to get, you know, probably a little hate in your DMs and stuff like that. And so we prepared them for that um, and empowered them to go forward if that's what they wanted to do. And so they've been able to speak to different groups and on different platforms and newspapers and, you know, news shows and just very proud of their commitment to stick with it. Yeah, thanks coach. And I know, you know, YouTube, uh, a lot of the uh, the table talks that they've been doing as well have been well received for that. And I think that, that you know, the other thing that you mentioned is that some of the uh, the students took it upon themselves to educate their teammates about mm. things like, you know, and uh, what's a, a HBCU and what's the divine nine. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. Know, so can you speak to some of that real quick? Yeah, you know, so it is, it is about, social media and really empowering um, and highlighting those things on our social media. And we've had a lot of teams even say, hey, we can't do this. We've had, I've had coaches say this to, to me, hey, we can't do this where we are. We're at a school in the South. Or hey, we can't do this. Our administration doesn't deal with that. But we love that you guys are doing it. Keep doing it. Keep, keep, keep holding that for us. And so um, that's been awesome. And, and so it is about the social media and getting out to the rest of the world, but we do a lot internally. And so uh, we have different departments within MTAD. And so we've got our community outreach, we've got our education, which happens in team, and then we've got our social media um, crew. And so um, we have educational sessions, which um, Kiara Jefferson, Kiara Jefferson is is over that for our team. And so we plan out through the month when she's gonna get in front of our team. They've laid out what they wanna speak about for the month and the months ahead. Months ahead. Um, and one of the things that I'm really excited about is they've started to incorporate their non-black teammates to help do some of the research. Cause you know, they, they have teammates that say, hey, you know, I know I don't go through what you go through but I love you and I wanna be an ally for you help me understand and to be active in my education about it. And so we do a lot of things um, educationally with our team to bring awareness to a lot of different facets. Um, and, and now the non-Black teammates are getting involved in doing researches. And so it's, it's cool to hear how that's impacting them and they're finding out different things they had, weren't aware of. And, you know, again, this is our program, uh, even before this was, was a program that talks about the hard things. And so it's really cool to um, to see it just seep through our team. Yeah, I appreciate hearing that, Coach. And it kind of reflects back on what, uh, what Dr. Howard was talking about, you know, to kick it off as well, of that educational piece being so important as well. So thanks for sharing that. You know, Coach, Absolutely. Coach, Coach Norwood, as we, uh, as we talk about, uh, you know, you being one of the leaders of the, uh, the football team, and I know I've seen the, the mentorship and the work that you do, but as somebody that, uh, you know, Coach Anderson, uh, referred to himself as, as being old and I'm I went to school with him so I guess that makes me old too so what as one of our more seasoned panelists as someone that you know grew up in the era of, of civil rights and uh, you know MLK and his fight for justice can you talk about uh, some of the work you're doing with the young men uh, on your football team regarding uh, social justice and taking action well um, thanks a lot you know Kenny and, and, and thanks um, to everyone involved with putting this together. I think it's uh, tremendous, uh, uh, VMI, Dr. Howard, everybody. Uh, one of the things that, like with everyone else, with uh, Coach Brown and Coach Avery, uh, the George Floyd uh, situation really uh, not only opened eyes, but uh, I think um, was a, a terrible situation, but I think the way it was handled by our young people was, was really tremendous. I sort of saw it right off the bat. Um, hey, one of my players, uh, the day that it uh, happened, or maybe a day or two afterwards, invite me to a uh, Athletes in Action little get-together they're having, which is one of the on-campus uh, ministry groups. And um, 
he invited me on and said, uh, uh, Coach, can you, it was Caleb Tulio, can you come and uh, just, just check it out? So I went on there really in, in sort of like in a fellowship type of deal, but also just to hear what the young people were feeling that time. And it was really amazing what uh, our young student athletes were talking about from all the different programs, male and female, and really hearing their heart, uh, hearing the struggles that they had with it. Um, at that same time, I was able to talk to all the guys and I coach the defensive backs. So my group is uh, made up in a really of a large portion of, of, of young men of color. And to hear them at that time talk about uh, where they were emotionally, their anger, uh, what was going on in the community, their concern with their little brothers or their relatives and what, what may be done, um, uh, both in, uh, in anger and in love, you know, just, just where it was at that time. So um, I was really moved to try to find a way uh, to allow the young people to have a voice, but have a voice that uh, moves in love, also have a voice that moves in something that's legal uh, uh, to be able to create some change. So, you know, at, at that time, you know, the biggest thing I sort of thought about was, uh, you know, hey, let's get, you know, get these guys registered to vote. Let's, let's do something that they can actively be a part, take a part in and uh, sort of move in that, uh, and move in that direction. Um, so I had talked to a few different coaches. I was calling around. Uh, one of the players on the team, uh, I think it was Quentin Lake, and one of the guys went with me on a Zoom. Uh, with the coach uh, from Tulsa, Baron Fletcher, he was doing it with some prosecuting attorneys, a lot of you know, a few coaches from HBCUs, uh, legal staff. Uh, I took you know, uh, uh, Q, I think I don't, a few other players, I believe, onto the uh, Zoom with me, and it was really eye-opening uh, in regards to what was going on, not just in California, but really all over the country at that time. Um, after that, I was thinking, oh, goodness, I should have said something to Chip. I sort of got in a movement. I said, call up Coach Kelly. Hey, just to let you know, I, I grabbed a few players. He was, Brian, shucks, that's fine. You know, I was uh, at San Francisco when Colin, Ka uh, Colin Kaepernick took a knee. I mean, this is something that's important. And I was really, you know, really uh, uh, thankful that his, 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 his whole heart was open to say, hey, do what you got to do and, and, and go ahead. So from that standpoint, um, just try to find a way uh, to educate our team and not just the, 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 the black student athletes on the team, but the whole team on what was going on in our country at that time. Um, so we started off having some educational Zooms uh, where myself, a gentleman from Swanee College, uh, Tim Tulloch at uh, 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 San Mateo Junior College, Kendall Montalolo at Navy, Aaron Fletcher, and just got together with coaches and tried to go to the AFCA and some other things trying to get the the something done at a, at a larger body um, didn't really hit hit some things that we thought we might have hit uh kenny stepped out on some things didn't really happen uh and then we said you know let's keep it hardcore just within our own program and our team and uh and our team jumped on it one of the things i can say kenny and, and you guys did a tremendous job of embracing the uh desire to get young people registered uh to vote uh the other thing that the young guys wanted to do um with the registration was also to educate. Uh, one of the biggest things I think that happened was uh, Dr. Howard when he came and spoke to the team. Um, Kenny, you had you know told me about Dr. Howard. Uh, I had a chance to to meet Tyrone and then just sort of talk to him about the all the terms that were being thrown around at that time: uh, equity, racism, um, uh, 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 white privilege, uh, uh, systemic racism. Uh, just all these terms that if you were to listen to either side of the stick, they were being used and thrown around really in the improper ways. So some of them created anger. Some of them created step back, uh, white privilege. You know, what, I, I'm, I never, I worked hard in my life, hard for my life. I never uh, was privileged with anything. But the great thing about it is that we had student athletes that wanted to understand what that meant. So Tyrone came on a Zoom with our whole football team that was eye-opening to everybody, from coaches to players, to everybody that was on the Zoom, explaining what those words really meant and giving backbone to all those things. So uh, after the Zoom, players, white, black, Polynesian, all of them were saying, goodness, I wish he could speak to everybody in the country because now we understand what that means. We understand what equity means. Uh, he had pictures, he had every way that you could understand those things and uh, did a tr tr tremendous job educating our guys. So. That part of it was great. Uh, we started doing some um, 
community service events. It was during COVID. Uh, so the guys were really excited about being involved with some uh, community outreach and backpack giveaways, food drives. Uh, the, the whole COVID time, as tragic as it was, was really a, a time to come together. And, uh, and I think uh, our guys did a great job of, uh, of just expressing themselves, also being involved uh, and being excited about really service during that time. Uh, I think service was another uh, aspect that came out of the whole uh, uh, um, situation that I think was, was very valuable. Um, they still do some stuff for Horace Mann, a community school, which has really been great. Um, one of our players during COVID said, let's start a pen pal service with the uh, Horace Mann. So each one of them had a, a majority of them had players uh, assigned to uh, uh, students and they were pen pals. I'm 56 years old. So pen pals when I was younger was white letters to kids in other countries. And uh, I, I was wondering, like, how did you hear of pen pals? You know, but I, I guess they, they still did it, but that was great. So um, ours have, has been really a, a process of love through service that uh, uh, the guys have sort of jumped on and uh, we got to continue to do more to organize. It's so great to hear what uh, Coach Avery and Coach Brown and their programs are doing. Uh, and we just love to be a part of it. Uh, uh, I am older, I've sort of lived through some, some of this stuff, busing uh, when I was in elementary school um, in Maryland, they bust really late, uh, but just segregating, desegregating the school, or segregating the, desegregating the schools, schools, excuse me, was a, an interesting thing, but uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of progress still to be made in a lot of areas. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Coach Norwood. And I know I, I've gone with you to a few, went to Horace Mann with your team and, and done a few things. And I've seen the football team really embrace uh, the, the activism and advocacy piece. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. And, you know, as we talk about student athletes being involved in the programming around it, you know, Rick, if uh, as our director of student athlete programming, uh, can you talk about, you know, some of the things you've, heard student athletes say that they want to participate in some of the things that they have done and them actually using their their platforms for social change. Well, thank you, Kenny, and, and thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be a part of this panel. Um, I, I think when I think about student athlete programming, um, it's it's significantly changed and it's it's really come a long way from, you know, I've been at UCLA now for 17 years and when I first started, um, the programming was very much about life skills and, and teaching life skills. And that was pretty much it. And it was a pretty cookie cutter formula as to what these life skills were. Um, but the problem with that is not everybody came from the same life or the same background and not everybody was gonna be going out into the world with the same opportunities. Um, and at that time, you really sort of avoided um, I guess what was considered to be controversial or uncomfortable conversations that just, you just didn't do it. Oh, we don't want to go there. Oh, we don't want to go there. Um, but what you were doing is you were stifling a lot of people and you were stifling a lot of conversations. And, and for us, fortunately, um, that has changed. And we have phenomenal student athletes that have been a part of that change. And, and, and the bottom line is no athletic department can do this by themselves. Um, and it's understanding uh, the resources that are out there and tapping into those resources. Um, and we've teamed up with some great organizations um, and had some great speakers come in um, to work with our student athletes. Um, we had, you know, Jen Fry who came in and spoke uh, to our student athletes um, and for our Wooden Academy. Usually the Wooden Academy was all about, you know, positivity and motivational and, and you know, all good, happy stuff, if you will. And, um, you know, we decided we were going to have that conversation. And, um, Jen came in and spoke about using conversation to educate and empower through uh, anti-racist lens on issues of race, uh, intersectionality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and we had this conversation. And, and the thing for me about our programming is, and I think it's a big mistake that a lot of um, athletic departments unfortunately fall into, is you become reactive to things. You wait until something happens and then you do programming. Um, and, you know, again, you know, Kenny, with your leadership and with Martin's leadership, things along these lines that we have been more proactive. So we had this conversation. And then, you know, a few months later, we have George Floyd's murder. Um, we've had this conversation. People know we've discussed this, um, that this isn't something that just happened today. This has been happening for a very long time. Um, and we've also had great programs with Team Impact. Team Impact 
um, is a program that comes in and talks uh, student athletes about using their voice for change. Um, and they've done some great programs with our Bruin leaders. They've done great programs with our freshmen. Uh, we had them with uh, so the football players as well this uh, summer. Uh, we've also done programming with Orange Arrow. Um, this trains and supports college student athletes to coach grade school student athletes in off field performance. So basically being mentors, being in that space, showing them how to use their voice as well. Um, and then as Brian uh, uh, talked about a little bit too, the Voting Matters Initiative. Um, I think that was one of the greatest things that we did. Um, uh, and we teamed up with uh, Bruin Vote. So it wasn't just our athletics, it was our whole UCLA community coming. And you're gonna hear from some of our student athletes here shortly um, that had a big impact on that and, and using their voice and making the change and educating people. Um, so I, I think it all comes down to is that you are, we are providing this space for our student athletes. We're giving them that space, but not just the space, we're also providing role models and leadership in those spaces now uh, that we haven't had in the past. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up, Rick. And I, I think what's important also is that our student athletes are asking for this. So a lot of people assume, well, UCLA or other schools are doing this programming because that's what's trendy now or that's what's popular now. And what I want people to know is our student athletes are asking for this. They're requesting this. And, you know, we can see how the conversations, like Rick mentioned, have changed throughout the years. Myself, you know, working here for over 10 years, we, I've seen the conversation shift where, you know, coaches that we have on this panel and other coaches in our department are actually encouraging our students to, to speak up and talk about that. So going back to, to you, Coach Anderson, one of the uh, one of the questions in the chat is actually a question that, that I was going to ask you. You mentioned, you know, being a former student athlete here at UCLA, the conversations back then and the conversations now, uh, somebody in our audience is asking, um, what differences have you seen in society and how it views these issues from during your time to now? So your time as a student athlete to now, what changes have you seen? And I know you've had conversations with your team about that because you have such a diverse team. So what are some of the changes or differences maybe that you've seen? I think the, the biggest one is, um, you know, not stifling the conversation, not stifling the thought, the progressive thought, being able to um, not necessarily uh, just sit down and be reactionary. You know, Rick talked about that. Um, we're engaged in conversation, you know, within our team that, that I never was engaged in with either my track or football coaches. Um, having uh, our students be leaders, having our students, student athletes um, out in society leading, not only now while they're students at UCLA, but into the future. That was not a conversation that was going on in the early 90s in the same way. It was more so, I'm the coach, I say, catch the ball, then you do what I say. And it kind of stops there. And that was, you know, really a, a difference in the, the decades. I think right now, um, I am a coach who um, will help to, to lead as much as I can. But honestly, I feel like I want to empower and get out of the way. Whereas I think the um, coaching body, you know, back then, that was just a different, it was a different, you know, space. So that's really one of the biggest differences. And I think it's great to see the student athletes leading, um, you know, the charge. And when it comes to these things that, um, you know, it's, it's more so shaping their future than it is shaping my future. And so I'm, I'm happy that, you know, the student athletes have the reins when it comes to that. And, you know, I think as, as a person of service, we're all here to help them, you know, do that, accomplish that goal. Definitely, definitely. And then uh, covering another question, Coach Brown, um, someone is asking about um, having conversations and, and difficult conversations at the time that there's a, a version that we probably all learned in grade school about MLK that was, you know, probably pretty sanitized, the uh, I have a dream speech and things of that nature. But there's a, there's a deeper activist lens of MLK that many people may not be aware of. And there's a, there's a connection between, you know, whether you're talking about MLK and um, Malcolm X or MLK and people that are viewed as quote unquote more militant. But I know your uh, team has been having these deep conversations and you mentioned them doing the research. So, you know, how do you have these conversations and how do you get student athletes to, to dig deeper and research things that they, besides just what they're learning in class? Yeah. <clears throat> well, for, for the young women we have right now, it, it wasn't too difficult. Um, the conversations were honest. Um, they were hard. Um, there was even tension at times between them and us, um, Coach Shannon and I, just with 
forcing them to think a little broader, go a little deeper. Um, their passion to know more they had, and, and they were willing to go, go deeper with that. But for us, it was about um, making sure what they said is was perceived as, as, as they intended it to be, intended it to go. And so, um, you know, they do the work, they do the background check, even on the the Bruin table talks and all the things that they put out, they spend the hours and hours researching that. Um, and they understand there's different styles. And I think even some of uh, our players would resonate a little bit more on the Malcolm X side, some on the Martin Luther side, but they, they, they both had one thing in, thing in common. And that was that for the equal treatment uh, of black people. And so, um, you know, I think back to some of the, you know, listening to coach Avery talk, some of the other athletes that I've coached at a different time, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and, and in part, it's like, you know, somewhat I owe them an apology. It was a different time, but I could see at times where my desire for them not to be viewed in a, in a certain light or not to be hurt from some of the comments, you know, really suppressed who they were and kind of whitewashed their message, so to speak. And so we are in a different time. And, um, I love that this generation is not just gonna settle for status quo. I do think they need guidance. Um, but at the same time, I do think this is a generation of learners and, and they really wanna speak their minds. And so, you know, our young women are, you know, they're learners and they do the work and they educate themselves. Definitely not, I've seen it firsthand. So I you know, <laughs> definitely appreciate, you know, on top of, as Dr. Howard said, them being students at you know, the number one public institution in the country, them being basketball players and you know, one of the top programs in the country, they also put in the work for this, not because they consider it something that you know, is forced upon them or something that you know, the coach is making them do or you or Coach Shannon making them do. It's something that they really, really value and are passionate about. So I love seeing the research and the work they put in and the presentations as well. Yeah, we also appreciate, if I could say Dr. Howard as well, he's met with our team a, a couple of times and um, you know, even with him, the conversations are, you know, at times painful, but necessary. And, uh, you know, I would just encourage other programs to sit in that space. You know, a lot of times it, it's messy and it's uncomfortable. And sometimes we don't want to have the upheaval because we don't want to do the work to figure out then what next. Um, but it's okay to not always have all the answers, but here at UCLA, I know that we've got a lot of people that can help facilitate conversation and help walk you through that. And so, you know, our staff has had tough conversations. Our team has too, uh, but it's necessary and we keep that dialogue open and, and to come back to it and to, you know, say, hey, we didn't get it right that time. Let's revisit it. Or if something pops up, a case, a decision, we talk about those things as well. Yeah. Definitely. And I appreciate that. So as as we start to transition to students, um, last two questions I have one for you, Coach Norwood, um, just thinking about, you know, the years that you've spent coaching, what does it mean to you, especially as a as a black man to be viewed as a role model and thinking of some of the teachings of uh, of MLK to be viewed as a role model by your students? Like how how impactful is that for you? Uh, you know, that's uh, that's extremely impactful. Um, I. Uh... I look at the, you know, the people in my life that have been role models, you know, outside of my parents, uh, a lot of them have been coaches. I mean, the people that have uh, coached me, whether it's youth to middle school, I feel like I've just been playing sports all my life. So uh, to be viewed in that light through sports, because, you know, that's where everything's sort of been tied into for, for me has been really a blessing because uh, I got into this uh because of that, you know, I got into it, you know, first of all, I think it's more of a, call, a calling than it is a, a job. I had other jobs. This um, is, is a lot more like a calling to be, uh, to be involved with and, and impact young people through sport and uh, having sport as a, uh, a tool for life as you pursue victories. Um, uh, and and victories, victories for me are, are different than wins. So, uh, and trying to be victorious in all situations. But, um, you know, I, I know that uh, I've, I've fallen short, uh, short many of times. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a man of faith and I'm striving in that direction just to be as, uh, as, as close, I, close as I can to the, the person I need to be for the guys and people that I coach and work with. Uh, but it's, it's really uh, been an, an honor and a blessing to, to be able to do this job. Uh, I think uh, it was a, uh, 
Um, was it Larry Graham or one of the ministers that talked about in coaching how much of an impact we can have uh, more than really any any other professions in the world in regards to the people that we come in contact with as, as student athletes um, and just people in general. So uh, our platform is, is, a, is a great platform uh, and to be able to do it in service and, uh, and also to be able to be impacted by these young people. I've learned more during this time uh, <laughs> from these, this younger generation. I, I, I told my son during the uh, protest marches they were having in LA, my son was telling me stuff, oh, dad, this, that, I'm like, and then I said, let me go to one of these marches. I wanna hear what these kids are saying. I went down there and, and I was amazed. I was amazed at the, the diversity of colors and the people that were speaking their heart and the, to, you know, the togetherness and the unity and the changes that were happening uh, in our country during that time. And it was young folks. I was like, okay, step back. and try to guide and help and make sure that I listen. No, thanks for sharing. And, and I know yeah. you and I talked about like just the impact you had of going out and hearing people talk about things that they were passionate about as well and the, the yeah. effect you had on you. So that's huge. Um, last question for you, Rick, as we, we transition to the, the student athletes is, you know, as someone that that I consider an ally that I know pretty well, I've known you for, you know, like you mentioned, 17 years now. Um, how can you talk to others in this space that don't identify as Black and in why it's important for the the burden of a lot of this not to be carried just by the the black people in the department yeah and i think um you know and kenny it's like it's so great having you in a position of leadership like i said we started out uh in this and i know you you've always had the same voice uh might not have been heard as much back then but i'm so happy that it is being heard now uh so always appreciate the work that you're doing um I, I think for me, uh, like early on in my career, it, it was very simple. Like I'd, I'd basically reach out to student athletes and ask, well, who wants to do this or what programming should we do or what fun activity should we do? And whoever raised their hand or spoke up is sort of who I went with. Um, and the problem wasn't, uh, was that I wasn't taking notice of who wasn't speaking up or even who wasn't being considered or why they weren't speaking up. Um, and I, I feel for me as, as someone that does come from a place of privilege, I mean, I didn't come from money, but I'm certainly male, I'm white, I'm perceived to be straight. So um, I think in that, that I understand that. And in my spaces, um, it's very, very important for me to make sure that I'm not being silent. But for me to be that person for our student athletes, um, what I've learned is that I have to slow down. I have to slow down and I have to listen um, because I think a lot of times, especially people in ally positions feel they want to fix things or they want to, to do something. And that's just not the case. It's like, it's better off um, to be that advocate, to be that support and let me do what you need done. Let me help me work for you, if you will. Um, so in my communities, do the work, I'm talking, I'm saying what I'm supposed to be saying, but for our student athletes, it's like for me as an ally, I certainly have to, um, you know, Kenny, you know me, it's like, it's very hard for me to be quiet. Uh, so, uh, but it is uh, slowing down that pace and listening to the student athletes and listen to what their needs are. Great, and we didn't even work on that, Rick, but when you talk about listening to student athletes, it sets up a perfect transition. So uh, Coach Anderson, Coach Brown, Coach Norwood, Rick, Really appreciate you just kind of setting the tone of what our department is doing, the ways that we can get better, the things that we, you know, are currently doing, but other things to think about and words of wisdom for folks out there that may either be coaching, teachers, educators, whatever it may be, to think about how they're navigating in this space. So I thank you all and want to transition now to the, the stars of our show, the student athletes. So thanks again, everyone. Um, thanks, yeah, absolutely. Thank so you. As we transition, I want to uh, uh, introduce our, our, our student athletes one by one. So um, Chase Griffin from, uh, from football, welcome Chase to, uh, to our panel. Um, Abby Forbes from, uh, from women's tennis, want to welcome Abby to our panel. Um, Natalie Cho from um, women's basketball. Natalie, thanks for, uh, for being here. And then uh, an alum, and you know, I, I reach out to, to Kaya McCullough all the time because uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge follower and a huge fan of hers. I think she's a, a, a must follow on Twitter and, you know, we'll get into the conversation, but I think Kaya really set the tone before I came here because I left for a while 
of uh, what it means to be an advocate, uh, advocate and an activist in this space as a student athlete. So really, really thank the four of you for being here. So Chase, Coach Norwood really touched on some of the things that you all uh, and on the football team, the conversations you've been having. And, you know, I know you're a, a remarkable person in the way that you think, the way that you've built uh, just this name for yourself. And with NIL, name, image, and likeness being one of the directions we see student athletes gaining voice, you've actually used your platform to not just, you know, earn money off NIL, which should happen, but also to create social change. Can you talk about some of the things you've been doing with the, the name, image, and likeness um, uh, programs that you've been attached to? Absolutely. So I have a partnership with my NIL, with the LA Food Bank, where proceeds of every single one of my deals uh, goes towards their weekend backpack program, where kids who rely on public school in a LA Unified School District uh, for free lunch and free meals during the week so that they have meals on the weekends. Uh, I think as an athlete, um, there's a long line of athletes who have used their sport and their platform for social progress, especially uh, athletes of color. A lot of the times, uh, sports are the only place where we get the closest to true equality, uh, just because the rules of games make it so that uh, it, it's the most equitable of, of all societal things. So I think that's why, uh, especially in UCLA's history, UCLA as an institution rests itself on, frankly, Black excellence and in, in the Black history of student athletes, both male and female. Like you have Jackie Robinson, Kenny Washington, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was Lou Alcindor at the time, but you also have Jackie joyner Kersey and Flojo, who really ushered in a new age of female sports. And then, uh, I, by using this platform today, um, if if you're a UCLA athlete and those are the student athletes who came before you, and I know that was a huge reason in me choosing UCLA, uh, just because it's a complete honor to wear the same jersey, walk the same campus, and uh, if you're not using your your platform, then I think. Uh, no shame on you, but I don't think you're maximizing your own opportunity to really uh, walk in the opportunity that you have. When you're at UCLA, uh, it's a special place. When you go away from UCLA, it's a special place to be from. But in our time here, um, in order to make the most and make use of the opportunity that, that uh, we, we're all so grateful for, uh, in addition to the work and, and uh, championships and, and winning that we all strive for it while we're here. Um, there's something longer lasting, which is the legacy. And uh, each of us only dream to be named in the same sentence as those who have come before us. And by using NIL, uh, which is uh, really a huge age being ushered in by Ed O'Bannon, a UCLA great, who still hasn't really received his flowers the way he should. Um, I think it honors all those who came before you, and it also allows for yourself to maximize your own opportunity to be a UCLA student athlete. Absolutely, Jason. I know, you know, a, a lot of student athletes just start learning about LinkedIn and build a profile, but you really used LinkedIn as a way to get the message out and, and talk about the work you've been doing on Instagram and all that. So kudos again to the, all the work that you're doing. Um, Abby, we've had you know a lot of conversation uh, earlier about George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, and, and other uh, uh, incidents that have happened. And I know that triggered a lot of conversation, especially amongst the the Black student athletes in our athletic department, which you know led to the formation of of BSAA and and something bigger that you started to build around the uh, BTSA. So can you talk to the group and talk to the audience about the formation of BSAA and what that was able to do, and then how you took that and also uh, formed the BTSA. Yeah, thank you, Katie, for having me and welcome everyone. So the Black Tennis Student Athlete Alliance is what Kennedy is referring to. That is something that I started right after the murders of Maude Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. And I definitely was having discussions with Kenny about it and trying to formulate what I was gonna do about my feelings about the situation. Because, you know, like Coach Brown mentioned earlier on in the panel, I wanted to do something more than just be upset about what was going on. And I knew that I've been in a predominantly white sport my entire life. 
And so the BTSA is an organization that I started for black tennis student athletes across the nation, across all, all divisions in June of 2020. And I have put a bit of a halt to it just for right now because I'm graduating, but it's allowed me to cultivate a lot of ideas on how I wanna move forward. Something that we've always enjoyed as a group has been the community that we've started because we travel across the nation. We travel and we see people that don't look like us all the time, but we never pay attention to the fact that there are people that look like us that play our sport. We just never got to connect. And so this gave us an opportunity to connect and to have somebody to talk about these issues with. And so what this has also done, it, is, it has inspired my former or my fellow student athletes at other schools to do things at their institutions. They see what I'm doing here at UCLA and they wanna implement something similar at their schools. And the UCLA BSAA has been amazing for me because I'm able to introduce them to that as well. And a lot of schools, especially you know, schools on the East Coast and primarily in the South, they don't necessarily have a Black Student Athlete Alliance. They don't have that level of you know, a community where they can talk about these things. So they see UCLA's BSAA and they see my BTSAA and they form their own on their own at their own institutions. And I feel like at the end of the day, that's the goal, you know, to promote inclusivity across the nation, across the globe. And if I'm contributing 1% to that, then I think I've had a job well done. And I think you're, you're undercutting. I think you've contributed a lot more than that 1%, Abby. So again, the work that you're doing is just phenomenal. I wanna give you, you know, your praise because you've, you've not only at this institution, uh, brought about a, a culture and conversations that needed to be had, but you've done it across the tennis world as well. So really appreciate that. So uh, we'll move over to Natalie. Natalie, I know Coach Brown talked about, um, you know, on the women's basketball team, the conversations you all were having. And, you know, as we think about Martin Luther King, you know, Martin Luther King advocated for, uh, uh, for Black folks and civil rights. But I think civil rights and social justice is a larger issue regarding all marginalized and minoritized groups. And I know uh, you and I have had conversation around the uh, stop Asian hate movement and things of that nature. So can you speak to maybe some of the conversations you're having on your team, not just about civil rights for, for Blacks, but what was going on with um, stop Asian hate in, in your part in having those conversations as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, thank you, Dr. Donaldson and everyone involved um, for the opportunity to speak. And I kind of wanted to go back um, to Abby. Um, you've from the creation of BSAA, like um, me and several other Asian American student athletes have also created um, what we call an AAA from your example. So just wanted to say thank you um, just from a different like group. So yeah, um, yeah. so uh, we've been having a lot of conversations on the UCLA women's basketball team um, since last, since yeah, last year. We understand that as a team, um, we're a family uh, and it's a safe space. And so this year, one of our team's like five commandments, um, something that are really pillars of the team is I will respect the integrity and heart of my teammates so that everyone feels safe, seen and heard. And so we came up um, with these commandments as a team and we all agreed to abide by them. And so something that I really appreciate that our staff um, did and does is creating designated discussion time, um, even during practice in the middle of season for everyone on the team to express ourselves, our experiences and opinions on certain things. And last year, like Coach, um, Coach T had mentioned before, our team created a leadership group called INTAD, More Than a Dream. And through that, we have the space to learn about each other's cultures, histories and experiences since we are such a diverse group. And I think um, that the women's basketball here at UCLA is having the essential hard conversations um, in a space where everyone feels welcomed and um, in an environment with very high trust, um, respect and love and something that will transform myself and also my teammates as individuals and people um, of the world. And so, yeah, I, um, I'm using my platform as a UCLA student athlete to spread awareness about the discrimination and racism that the Asian American community um, is facing. So back when quarantine um, first started, government officials and higher up people began using very harmful rhetoric, um, such as like Chinese virus and Kung flu to, revo 
to refer to COVID. And so this really put my community um, in a dangerous position as xenophobia and hate increase around the culture, I mean, the country and ultimately the whole world. And so I decided to compose a tweet and go to social media that addressed the situation in my own experience. And I knew and know that I'm very blessed um, with the platform that I have as a student athlete um, at UCLA. Like Chase had mentioned, um, so many people before um, this generation um, had done before um, to reach different communities. And I really wanted to use for good. And so I tweeted about how I was feeling and about the climate of the world regarding this topic. and. Uh, I just really wanted people to understand and empathize with what other groups um, were going through. And so, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Natalie. And I know that, um, you know, I, I taught a class that you were in. I felt like your contribution to that class was valuable as well. So I know, you know, talking to your coaches, the, the contribution you bring to your team is, is amazing as well. So kudos to you again and all the work that you've been doing. Um, so, Kai, I want to uh, thank you for joining us and also, you know, as an alum, um, would love for you to speak on, you know, when you were at UCLA, you really kickstarted this platform of activism and advocacy. And, you know, as you've gone on to, uh, you know, a professional career, you've continued to do that, not only through social media, but through your actions that have transformed the whole NWSL. So, you know, if you don't mind, can you tell folks kind of how things started for you at UCLA for your platform and kind of where you've taken that to now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for having me here. It's always nice to be surrounded by current and former UCLA student athletes. Um, it really is such a unique environment and I give a lot of my credit to UCLA in even pushing me on the path that I'm on now. I would say that my activism, <laughs> really my journey started probably in high school, but it really was kickstarted at UCLA. I was a sophomore. I was 19 years old, it was 2017. Colin Kaepernick was kneeling for the national anthem and I wanted to do something similar. I, you know, Donald Trump had just been elected and I, it was nothing new that <laughs> there was hate against black and brown Americans especially, um, but police brutality was definitely an issue that has been around for a long time, especially against black and brown Americans, Rodney King in LA area specifically. And I remember being on Twitter at some point um, that year during my season and seeing a really traumatic video of, I can't even remember which, which I think is a commentary on the times um, of an unarmed black child being murdered by police and some sort of switch kind of flipped for me and I realized that, you know, I had a platform as small as it was. Um, I had a platform and I was going to use it in order to speak about the issues that I was concerned about. So I immediately called my mom, called my dad and was like, hey, I'm going to kneel. Um, this might be controversial because it was at a time when, you know, Colin Kaepernick was getting a lot of hate by the media and by our president for doing what he was doing. And I knew that there might be consequences for it, but I, I really felt compelled um, to use my platform in whatever way I could. And then I immediately contacted my coach, Amanda Cromwell, and I was like, hey, I need something, I have something I wanna to talk to you about. Uh, it's involving kneeling and Colin Kaepernick, can we talk? And so the next day we had a great conversation, probably 30 to 45 minutes about how I was feeling, um, just in the political climate of the world and of the country and what I plan to do and why it was important to use my voice. And then the next day after that, we had a conversation with the, with the entire team. And that was really where kneeling for us as a team was born. But, you know, my activism was inspired, uh, like Chase said, you, you go to UCLA and it's almost an overwhelming feeling, especially as a black athlete of, all the people and all the greats who came before you, not only for the sport that they play, but for the difference that they made in the world. And for me, I think being able to walk the same halls of those greats and those people who made such a difference in the world was really inspiring and really empowering for me and gave me the confidence in myself to really express how I felt and make a difference in the world around me. From there, it sort of snowballed um, <laughs> to where I am at now. 
I think, you know, that initial kneeling, it was one of the scariest moments of my life, but it really did give me the sense of power that I have now and that I'm able to use and share with the world in creating other change. Um, I continued to kneel throughout my time at UCLA and I continued to do it while I was in the NWSL, which just so happened to be the year that the world went to a global pandemic and um, George Floyd was murdered, Breonna Taylor was murdered, Ahmaud Aubrey was murdered. And I think from there, it just, you know, the initial instance of me kneeling gave me the motivation and the power to continue using my platform. And the more I spoke up, the more it grew. And again, it sort of just snowballed. And I unfortunately had to go through some pretty awful things at the club that I was at, um, dealing with verbal, emotional abuse, and even some racial abuse. And I think my experience kneeling and the experience in knowing that I could use my voice and have my voice be heard um, and not, you know, suffer too many consequences allowed me to find the strength and the power to speak up again when it was needed. So I've really just tried since leaving UCLA to, to use my platform as best as I could. I think, you know, being a student athlete at such a prestigious university like UCLA, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And much like Chase said, it's it's really important for student athletes to be using their platform for social good, especially. Um, I feel like we're definitely at a turning point in American society where we need as many voices fighting the good fight as we can. And so I think it's really important for athletes and for student athletes specifically who are still in college to be using their platform that they have and trying to advance the causes that they care the most about because every voice matters. And, um, you know, it, it could end up turning into you having a radical realization that you want to go to law school and change the world that way. So um, I, I really think it just starts with, you know, deciding to make a difference and deciding to educate yourself and care about and fight for the things that you believe in. Definitely, and I appreciate that, Kai. And I've been I've been following the law school acceptances you've been receiving, you know, through Twitter that you report. So, congrats on on all those. You have a choice of some great schools to go to. So, you know, that's that's been great. And like you said, to carry on that work from making it from a passion to a, a profession that you're passionate about is huge as well. And you know, speaking of that, um, Chase, you know, you've had conversation and you mentioned about giving Ed O'Bannon his flowers about how you know, UCLA might think about honoring not just Black student athletes, but student athletes from the past that have uh, created change and brought about uh, social justice causes and things of that nature. Can you speak to a little of, I know you had talked to, uh, I believe it was Coach Kelly for softball about some of the ideas you had. Can you share, you know, with the audience, maybe some of the, the ideas and things that you had? Yeah, uh, I appreciate you giving me this time for this plug, but uh... Uh, Coach Kelly I is great. I got to uh, meet with her virtually towards the end of 2021. And uh, she's all about UCLA. I'm all about UCLA. She's a living legend. She's connected uh, to a whole bunch of other living legends of the Bruin family. And uh, what I saw was that I have a huge love for UCLA. Um, and, but UCLA doesn't brag about itself enough. And I think that uh, Part of it is, is yeah, it's, it's good for recruiting. It's good for, uh, look how good we are. But it also reminds us of who we are. And uh, in order to remember why UCLA means so much, the four letters, uh, we have to look at the people who came before and, and are still here. Uh, that sets the pathway for the future. Um, student athletes who come here have to know what UCLA is about to embody it. And so I think uh, through a series, uh, which we're still working on, but we're going to get it done. Um, we're going to honor a lot of these living legends that we have. And, and there's, there's people who uh, have changed the world, have changed their sport, uh, have been excellent champions on and off their respective fields or courts of play. And uh, by using UCLA to honor them and give them their roses, I think it sets the right tradition going forward. And it keeps in mind uh, what the true standard is for those coming after us. Yeah, I appreciate you, Chase, dealing with that curveball I threw you. I know you didn't know I was going to ask you that, but I felt like, you know, we've got an audience here and, you know, we're recording this. So who knows who might see it and 
contact you, contact me, contact the athletic department saying they want to get behind something like that. So I thought, you know, this was as good a time as any to, to bring that up because it follows in that idea of, of, of the legacy that's here and the folks that have uh, set the path for, you know, the four of you and others. Um, so thanks for that. Um, Abby, as, as we talked about some of the conversations that you and other Black tennis athletes across the country are having, we also talk about the conversations that you were having on your team. And I know, you know, UCLA was a, was a, um, a pioneer as far as, you know, you had three or four other Black teammates at one time, which you don't see across the country in tennis. And that really started a lot of the conversations. Can you talk about what the conversations have been like, you know, for the last few years on your team as you've transitioned with having almost one third or almost one half of your team be Black to now, I believe you're the only uh, Black student athlete on your team, but the conversations have been set so that you have felt comfortable and felt empowered to have that. So if you could speak to maybe what it's looked like on your team, I would appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, before I can get into that though, I need to explain what being a Black female tennis student athlete means at UCLA. So it has obviously brought me a lot of pride and gratitude. There was one point in time where we had a lineup, one, two, three, and four singles were all Black people. That was unheard of. And that was something that was put into the press. That is something that people heard about worldwide. And they were astonished at the fact that that even happened. Some people were upset, some people were not. Some people were empowered, like myself. Not everybody gets the opportunity to be on a team that has another Black person on it in the tennis world. There are a lot of programs that have only one Black member, kind of like me right now, or there's none. There are some programs that have never seen a Black person be on the tennis team before. Seeing people that look like me in positions that I want to be in has always led me to believe in myself that much more. And I do want to mention some of the names of the people that have come here that have inspired me, you know, to even want to be in this position, to be a student athlete at UCLA, to believe that I could be here. And, you know, these are including but not limited to Terry Fleming, Robin Anderson, Jada Hart, Ian Broomfield, and Gabby Andrews. And these girls are like older sisters to me now. And I'm very fortunate. If I ever need anything, they've always been there for me. The sense of community that we have is because of them and who they are as people. And Stella and Rance have reached across what is the standard norm in the tennis community. And they've invited young black girls to come and play for their team. And as a collective, we've done quite well. And not to toot our own horn, but we have a collective three Grand Slam titles, two national championships, five All-American Award honors, and one Honda Sports Award. So we've done quite well. But as far as the discussions go, you know, having said all of that, that's inspired me to keep these conversations going. And those are the people that inspired me to stand up for Black people and make sure that there will be Black people that come to this program after me. And so we started having the discussion surrounding race, of course, after the murders of Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery. And we began to discuss what race meant to, the, meant to each of us. And not going to lie, at first, these conversations were very difficult. But I invited my teammates to lean into that uncomfortability and to make sure that they knew in the end that this conversation has purpose. And it was more important for the people who were not black in the conversation to have the conversation than anything else. Because at the end of the day, it's not, it wasn't about somebody being right or wrong. It was about people being educated, people being more inclusive, people eliminating some words maybe out of their vocabulary. And so we were very fortunate to work with certain psychologists like Dr. Parham. He was amazing. And he created a safe space that allowed everybody to have an equal opportunity to speak what they were feeling. And he was able to then guide the discussion to make sure that we were talking about the things we needed it to. And I've been fortunate to have had two Black staff members and one Black teammate. Most people don't get that. And so I've had their support, even when, you know, watching people who look like me die on camera, I've had their support behind me. And so I never felt alone. I can only imagine what some other black tennis players feel like. So I've ver been very fortunate to go to a school where I have that level of support of our black alumni, of our black coaches, and of our black athletes here at UCLA, you know, like Chase and so many others. 
So to kind of close it off, you know, these conversations are the reason why I stay here and the reason why I feel that UCLA, specifically our women's tennis team, is one of the best teams in the country. Not because of our accolades, not because of our tennis skills, but the fact that our girls are willing to lean into conversations that make them uncomfortable and they're willing to provide a safe and inclusive space for those that not only don't look like them, but come from a different walk of life. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Abby. And I know I, I've facilitated some conversations with your team, like you said, that, you know, may be difficult at times, but the fact that, like you mentioned, Stella and Rance are willing to provide that, that forum and your teammates feel, you know, empowered to not just hear and listen, but actually, you know, say things that they uh, are, are feeling and thinking and, you know, be open themselves up at times to say, hey, you know, this is this is how I feel or this is what I'm hearing. Can we talk around this? I, you know, I give, again, your coaches um, uh, definite respect for for opening that up and your teammates as well. So thanks for for sharing that. And then, you know, kind of transitioning on that same note. So Natalie, um, you know, I, I talked to, to Rick as, you know, a, an ally in that space. And, you know, I know I would definitely consider you an ally and your teammates have said that in that space. For those out there that may be listening that uh, are trying to support their Black teammates or teammates of color in some space, and you know, you are an athlete of color as well, but how would you identify as an ally and what are some things that allies need to think of when they're supporting their Black teammates? Yeah, um, it means a lot to me um, to serve as an ally to my Black teammates and also my Black coaches. Um, just having that, that they knowing that they trust me with their experiences and what they've been going through um, just means so much to me. Um, so my position as an ally um, transforms every day to whatever um, my teammates and coaches need from me. Some days I'm a safe space um, where they feel comfortable um, expressing how they feel um, about certain things. And for me, like having no judgment, um, just being like a listening ear for someone, um, for my teammates to talk to. Um, and some days, I'm that liaison, that translator um, for my teammates to other communities like my own um, about what they face every day. And so I'm very lucky to have the trust um, of my teammates and coaches who are willing um, to share their stories and who are willing to um, teach me and also be my role models and mentors um, in that way. Yes, definitely. Thanks for for sharing that, Natalie. And I, you know, again, like I mentioned, I've seen it firsthand. So I, I know that, you know, in that space, your teammates really value your voice. They value uh, just the the protection that they feel like you provide from uh, being able to listen and provide a safe space. So appreciate that as well. Um, as we we kind of wrap up this panel, Kaya, um, a, a question from the audience, which ties into something I was going to ask you is, and, and I know you're, you're going to answer this in a great way, so I'm glad I'm, I'm directing it towards you. Um, how do you deal with, the, in this case, they said shut up and dribble, and I guess that technically can apply to your sport. So how do you how do you deal with the shut up and dribble people who criticize athletes who speak out on important issues? And, you know, to kind of tie into that, another person said, how do you keep the fire going or how do you keep that passion going when there may not be an incident currently happening that brings it to the forefront? So. I'm going to kind of give you a two part one, Kaya, to, to take us out. But, you know, the first part, I would say that that shut up and dribble crowd. How do you deal with that? Yeah, you're you're leaving me with some big questions. <laughs> yeah. um, the practice that best serves me at the point in my career and my life now is the block button. First and <laughs> foremost, I know that seems intense, but it really has been, you know, a way for me to preserve my sanctity and my mental health in doing this work. I think anybody who works and especially the racial justice space knows how exhausting it can be mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And the block button has been my best friend over the past two and a half years. But on a more realistic note, I think, you know, the people who are proclaiming just shut up a dribble or are just, you know, seeing athletes as these entities for entertainment, I think this goes into a much longer conversation about the way in which black and brown athletes are exploited as laborers um, for a predominantly white society and for a predominantly white ruling class that makes money off of their backs. But again, whole other conversation. Um, I, I definitely think that these people are, are repeating the same cycles that we as black and brown athletes are trying to break out of. Um, I think they are, you know, 
just spouting rhetoric that is really harmful to black and brown communities. And I think, you know, for me, part of my growth and part of my journey was sort of, you know, this sounds corny, but ignoring the haters. I think I began to find my power once I was able to see myself as a whole person. And once I was able to see myself beyond my value as an athlete and instead towards my value as a person. And I think, you know, the people who are saying shut up and dribble don't see that inherent value in others and especially not in athletes. And so I think part of the strategy is block, part of the strategy is ignore, and part of the strategy is you know, not prove them wrong, but um, continue to just stand in your own power and make this, the, the impacts that you are able and capable of doing, um, despite the naysayers. I think, you know, I've certainly been met with my fair share of haters or trolls or whatever you want to call them these days, but I think, you know, acknowledging myself and my sanctity as a person and my role in affecting change has really allowed me to get past that narrative of you know you should just shut up and dribble Kaya and I think once I embraced that I was able to more clearly see my life path and for me you know it's it it's kind of weird hearing athletes say this and it might not be the case for everybody but I think me as an athlete my role as an athlete as a soccer player specifically was a means to an end I think soccer was a vehicle for me to find my voice and to develop my leadership skills and to learn how to interact with different communities and learn how to navigate the world so that I can better affect change for the rest of my life. I think my path is definitely to help people. And I think soccer was, again, a vehicle for me to do that. And it gave me the platform and the space to grow into the person and I guess the activist that I am today. Um, what was the second part of your question? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it was a long. So I think it's tied to that because, you know, I've seen what's happened sometimes with, with online, how people are coming at you or things that people are saying. How do you keep the the flame and the passion going when there's not a George Floyd or, you know, Ahmed Arbery or Breonna Taylor when, you know, we know these things go on and we may not see them on TV, but how do you keep the passion or keep that activism uh, alive? when there may not be a specific incident to point to? Yeah, the very simple answer is, I think back to my ancestors and I think back to the people who came before me and all that they suffered through and all that they fought for and all that they went through. And I think it would be a disservice to them and it would be a disservice to my community to not carry the torch forward and to not keep the ball rolling forward. And, you know, even though it gets really, really hard, like I said before, racial justice work is exhausting. I think, you know, part of our role in existing in the society that we live in today is carrying on the legacy of the people who came before us, whether that's the legacy of student athletes mm -hmm. or whether that's the legacy of black activists, whether that's the legacy of your grandma or your great grandma. I think we have a responsibility to keep our story moving forward and I think one of the things that makes me the most proud to be a black woman is knowing all that my people have suffered and still seeing how much they have contributed to the world and what it is today and um, you know awe isn't a word that fully encapsulates the feeling that I feel when I think back to where I came from and where my roots are from so I know that seems very, you know, spiritual and up in the air, but for me, it really is a, a large motivator. And then on the other end of it, I think about the people who are coming after me and knowing the things that I've experienced and knowing the pain that I've gone through, I would never wish that on somebody who, who came after me. I would never wish that on another, you know, little black girl who was just trying to find her place in the world. So I think, you know, putting it, in perspective that we are just pieces in a, in a much bigger puzzle and um, we are just another stop on the continuum for progress is sort of what keeps me motivated in doing this work, even when it gets hard, even when there's a lot of despair, even when, you know, there is instances of, you know, Black people getting murdered on camera in front of us. I, I think that 
sort of bottling that pain and using it to then fuel the rest of the work that we do is is how I maintain my passion and my fire. Yeah. So I, mean, I want to thank you for for always being your authentic self, and I think you know that's for for all four of you, but especially you know Kai, I know that. Uh, being a, a visible presence online um, invites people into your space that you may not want in there and they have their own thoughts and the way that I've seen you handle it has been tremendous. So again, kudos to you and, and everything that you've done, you know. So yeah, absolutely. So as I, as I for the sake of time, take us out of this panel, um, one of the questions that someone sent me directly and luckily I came prepared with it is when you're doing racial justice work, whether it's in athletics, outside of athletics or whatever it may be, what are some things to think about? And I, I wrote down five things before this panel that I hope those of you that are, uh, you know have stayed tuned on and thank you that for those of you that have stayed with us need to think about when you're doing work when whatever space it is that you're in to, to promote equity, justice and uh, belonging. First thing would be, and, and our guests have touched on this, but be prepared to have open eyes thought, open, honest dialogue and not get defensive. What I've seen a lot of times is when you're talking about race, when you're talking about gender, orientation, identity, whatever it may be, people have a tendency to say, well, that's not what I meant, or that's not what, you know, and they get defensive. And I just want to encourage everyone, be prepared to have open, honest dialogue and not be so defensive and listen. Second thing is sometimes unlearning is just as important, if not more important than learning. We all are socialized certain ways. And we think that the way that we were raised, the way that we learned this is the only way. And I think one of the things I've learned in doing this work is unlearning some of the bad implicit bias and things that you have is almost more important than learning new things as well. So always be prepared to unlearn about people, things that you may uh, have thought about them. Third thing kind of tied to that is know your positionality and be aware of your own implicit and explicit uh, um, biases along with your blind spots. So don't assume that just because you grew up in a certain environment or a certain neighborhood, you understand that group, or just because you grew up or you're on a team with people that look like you, that you understand that. Always, you know, I always reflect at the end of the week on what are things I could have done better? What have I learned this week? And what is something that I need to educate myself on to be better about? Fourth thing, um, all folks who identify under certain groups are not monoliths. So again, you know, when you're thinking of someone that's from a certain ethnic group or someone that identifies as LGBTQ plus or someone that identifies as black, don't ask for them to speak for the whole group because a lot of times their experience is their experience and that shouldn't be a universal experience. So always be wary and be mindful, especially, you know, you know when I think of a coach, if you have a student athlete like, you know, Abby, who may be the only Black student athlete on our team, or Natalie, who may be the only Asian student athlete on the team, to ask them to speak for the experience of all Black tennis players or all Asian basketball players is not right. So as coaches, but also in spaces, think of your own positionality and think of the folks who identify and not putting them in that spot. And last, especially at a, a school like UCLA, and you know most of the folks that are on here are probably practitioners in higher ed, always reach out to experts because again, for myself, I can speak to my experiences, but we have so many resources in such a powerful uh, uh, school like UCLA that has so many tools that we could use. So reaching out to experts and asking them to educate you about things that you need to learn more about, I think is important as well. And don't be afraid to ask questions that will help you to learn more about others. So, um, you know, Kaya touched on this as well as our group, but just know that DEI work is not, it's not easy, it's not pretty, and it's not fun. But in order to create the change that we want to see, like Martin Luther King talked about, we have to be ready to have uncomfortable conversations. We have to be ready to, like I mentioned, unlearn some of the things that we think we may have known. And we have to be ready to change and have conversations and have communication and dialogue with folks that don't look like us, that aren't from our same background, that may be from different areas. And only then can we build a community and start to build a world that I think uh, MLK had wanted and he saw. And again, I have the fortune of working in athletics, which is one of the most diverse places on campus as far as numbers. But I think when we talk about inclusion, equity and belonging, those are very different things in diversity. So always working towards building an equitable space in athletics that's inclusive and creates a sense of belonging for coaches, student athletes and staff and whoever it may be. And again, the, you know, these four people that are on here along with the coaches and administrators on are some of the, the, the pillars of our department that you, know, you could see from someone like Kai that 
you know, started at UCLA or even a little before, and is still carrying it on from Chase, Abby, and, and Natalie that are continuing to do it. And I know they'll continue to do great things. Hopefully with UCLA, UCLA athletics, we're working on getting better and better every day to create that environment here. So I want to thank you all for tuning in. Thank you for your time. Panelists, thank you for being here. Everyone have a great night.